In today's video, we're gonna be covering this all-in-one board from Eashin. Now, this is the same board that was installed or that comes inside their Novice 3. Now, their Novice 3 is quite, I think, one of the best micro toothpick slash drones that they've ever released here. And before continuing on, I do have timestamps linked down below and also showing in the video progress bar. So you can go ahead and skip to whatever part you wanna see. So some of the things we're gonna be covering today is we're actually gonna go into detail over the components that are on the board and what are the advantages and disadvantages of these boards because they usually come in two types. They come with dedicated FETs for each phase and also dual FETs for each phase. And we're gonna cover that slightly in this video. And I'll also be showing you how to do the binding process other than the configuration and just about everything you might wanna know. So let's go ahead and get started here. So the first thing we're going to cover is the specs and the components on board and what are the advantages of this type of layout versus other types of layouts. So first of all, this is a crazy B type board. So 25, I think 0.5 by 25.5 layout. So it's, a, it's not a 20 by 20 or a 30 by 30. It's just a crazy B type. So just keep that in mind. It is using M3 holes. So these are three millimeter holes here. And another thing to take into consideration here is these little notches here, you could actually pop these off and you can remove them and it might make your life a little bit easier depending on the quadcopter you're setting up but i usually prefer to keep them on unless i really have to take them off now me personally i've always loved all-in-one boards but the only downsides to all-in-one boards is if one thing goes bad then you're gonna have to throw away the whole thing and just get a complete new one here now the specs on here are really great so it's a 12 amp esc's or we could say theoretical 12 amp ESCs. I wouldn't push them more than nine amps. And the input voltage is rated two to three SHVs. It can run four SHVs, but you have a higher probability of burning this. So keep that in mind. So let's take a closer look at this type of design. And, and it really has to come down to the ESCs. This is how the ESCs are actually uh, routed and made on these boards. Now, if we take a closer look here, we see these three paths, which correspond to a motor output. And again, because the ESCs are built in here. Now, each motor needs basically three wires to run or operate. And now each of these wires here on a normal typical ESC, like a full-fledged ESC, you would have two MOSFETs here. So you'd have two MOSFETs for this phase, two MOSFETs for this phase, and two MOSFETs for this phase. Now some all-in-one boards of this nature do give two dedicated MOSFETs for each phase. However, some other boards do uh, the two MOSFETs in one phase. FET, which it's like a dual channel FET here. And that's what this board's doing. Now, it's always better to have two dedicated FETs per phase, in my opinion. That would be my recommendation, especially on a very power hungry setup or a small toothpick that's pretty power hungry, then a single dual channel FET for each phase. And this one is doing the single dual channel FET. So it's just one FET per phase, but it has the two FETs built in. The heat dissipation is much less, and the, in the, in the, in the overall current delivery or the power delivery is going to be slightly less than a proper two separate dedicated FETs for each phase. So this is using the single FET or the single dual channel FET here for each phase. It's not bad, but I'd still recommend, especially if you're going to be, you know, especially in crashes, this is where it shows the most. I would definitely go for a dedic two separate dedicated FETs for each phase here. So that's one thing that's uh, slightly different about this. And now also another reason why they would do that is because this board here also has an FR Sky D8 receiver. You can see the antenna ports here. They do provide you with the antennas. So it has a D8 receiver built in here. And that is one reason why they've decided to go with the dual channel FET so they could have a bit more space here because you're quite limited in the amount of space. I mean, I've tried to design my own F4 flight controller with OSD and nothing special, just the OSD uh, schematic is an absolute nightmare. It is just insane to route all of these things, but to do all of this together is just on a whole other level. So I'm, I'm really, it's crazy to see that they're able to do this. This is probably like a six layer uh, PCB board here. Now for the microcontroller unit, it is using an F4 microcontroller unit here, which is going to do the job just fine. We also do have on-screen display. We do have a 5-volt regulator, which I think is down here. Yes, a 5-volt switching regulator. We can see we have a shunt resistor for current reading, but not current reading for each ESC, just for the whole board here, which is really nice to see. We have a 3.3-volt regulator, and this is uh, used to power up all the microcontroller, most of the microcontroller units on board. We have our FET drivers here. We also have the F4, which is 3.3 volts. If this is the ATOSD, yes, it is the ATOSD. So this is also taking 3.3 volts. Now, also, if we flip it over to the other side, again, we see the 5 volt regulator. We see the 3.3 volt regulator, the shunt resistor. We see our MOSFET drivers right here, which are these guys right there. There's four of them. 
And if you take a closer look here, also the filtration is quite minimal. So if you're going to be installing this, I'd highly recommend you also add low ESR capacitor to this. Now, if you are running uh, SBUS or an FR Sky, then you're going to be able to work with this without installing a receiver because it does have the receiver built in. However, if you're using iBus, we're going to cover that in the connection setup part of this video. Now, also another thing to take into consideration if you're using um, an SBUS or an FR Sky transmitter is that the inbuilt receiver only works on FCC variants of the firmware. So you have to keep that in mind. It works D8 and D16, but you want to run it on D8 if you have this board because I've tried the D16 on these and uh, the range is, is quite horrendous. So for setting this up in your quadcopter, it should be installed just like this where the USB is on the back left here. And that would mean motor one, two, three, and four would be set up right here. So you have motor one would be on the back right, motor two, motor three, and motor four. Now, the next thing you want to do is obviously apply power here, which is going to be from your XT30 or whatever you might be using. And you're going to want to use these two pads right here. You have ground, which will be the black and LiPo, which is going to be the positive. Now, and again, I highly recommend you add some sort of a small low ESR capacitor to this because the filtration is very, very minimal. So make sure you, you could buy these XT30s with uh, capacitors. I'll have them linked down below, pre-made ones. I actually get a couple of them every once in a while just to uh, save myself some time. And they're executed pretty pretty good actually very usable and uh, i have nothing to worry about in that perspective so now let's go ahead and cover the camera so for camera we only have five volt option which is really great and most of the cameras just take five volts anyways so for camera where you want to set that up now let's start with the yellow wire which is your video signal the yellow wire is going to want to go right there so that's going to be our video input right here so it's kind of confusing here because of the, the naming structure so that's where your camera's yellow wire would go then you want to skip one over which is going to be this one right here. And that's going to be five volts. So that'll be the red wire for your camera. And then the next one over is going to be the ground, which is going to be the black wire of your camera. Now for video transmitter, you have two uh, possibilities, whether yours is just a five volt. And if it is a five volt video transmitter, then before installing your camera's five volt in ground, you're gonna wanna take your red wire from your video transmitter, your red wire from your camera, put those together and install them on the five volt pad right here. And same thing goes for the ground, which is the black wires. You wanna put your black camera wire and your video transmitter's black wire together and install them on the ground right here. And that would give you power. Just makes your life a little bit easier because in the video transmitter, what you have left of the video transmitter is either one or two wires, depending on your setup. But the most important one is the yellow wire, which is the video line. And that's gonna go right here. So that's gonna be on V out right there. And then if you have smart audio, where I'd highly recommend you actually install this would be on a TX1 pad which is going to be the one right next to the camera's video line, which is this right here. So if you had Smart Audio or Tramp IRC, this is where you want to install it. Now, if you wanted to install a buzzer, where you want to set that up would be right here. We have our buzzer minus, which is going to be the ground sign, and then the positive for the buzzer right here, and that'll initialize your buzzer setup. So before installing this, also don't forget to install the antennas. It could be a bit of a nightmare. So one antenna goes here, and then the other one goes here, and it's on the back side of the board. So once you do that, you want to go ahead and locate the bind button. So now the bind button is going to be located next to the F4, which is this one right there. And we have this little LED all the way up in the corner right there. And that's going to give us the status of the uh, binding process. So with this LED, we could figure out a couple things. Now, if you boot this on for the first time by plugging it into a USB or something, well, you'll find it, you'll find it blinking. And blinking means no RC. However, the blinking also has another function, which I'll tell you what it means in a bit. So if it's blinking, that means you're not connected. So what you want to do is you want to hold the bind button and then probably plug in a USB. Then it would go into bind mode. Now bind mode, it'll just be completely solid. So it won't flash or anything. It'll be just a solid LED. And once you use your transmitter and actually bind, then it'll start blinking, telling you or giving you confirmation that your binding is successful. Once that's done, you always have to reboot. So just unplug it, reboot, exit the bind mode in your controller, and then you should see a solid light. And that means you're basically connected, especially if your transmitter is on. And it should be very simple. However, what about if you had an iBus and you bought this anyway? So what can you do? You could still use iBus on this, but not for on the inbuilt receiver here. We're gonna have to take advantage of the UART pads right on this edge right here. So you just need three pads. We're gonna need a five volt ground and an R pad. And the best place to get those would be right here actually. 
So here would be an RX2. RX2 is going to be your IBUS signal. That's where you want to go ahead and set up the IBUS signal. Next over, we have ground, and the ground is going to be the black wire from your IBUS receiver. And then the next one over is going to be 5 volt, which is the red wire, and that would give it power. And in your beta flight ports tab, then you want to set up UART2 or yeah, UART2 as your serial RX. And then when you go down the configurations tab, don't forget to save and reboot after each step. When you go down to your configurations tab, you want to make sure you find your receiver, serial based receiver in the drop down section. And then another one will appear and you can set that up as IBUS and you're good to go into that perspective. And that's basically how you'd set this up. Very simple, very straightforward, and you shouldn't have any problems doing this. Now, I forgot to also cover one more thing, which I do apologize for. If you had a video transmitter that does not take five volts, how would you set that up? Well, you wanna put, again, your V out here, your ground here, the black wire, you could set it up right there. And your red wire, you're gonna to wanna to take it from the LiPo Plus here, the positive over the battery, and then you'll be able to power your video transmitter. That's if it takes more than five volts, because some video transmitters only take five volts and some take seven and above. If yours is the seven and above, then you're gonna want to put the red wire right there and you're good to go. And well, that's it guys. I really hope you guys enjoyed the video. Everything's linked down below. If you can check those out, those really support channel. And come join my Patreon Well, I give out all this stuff for free. Like, I do a ton of giveaways. New Patreons for the month get their own giveaway. Like, last month I had two new Patreons, and there was just a giveaway between those two. And it's a proper giveaway. They're not some shitty no-name stuff. I do give, like, the brand new Runcam Fox Sears, the Hawkeye 4K, the Quadcopters. I, I do a ton of giveaways, more than one per month, up to ten at times, and even more uh, very soon. So I really hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out.